Hi, welcome to the T's review for the reading section of the test. My name is Billy Jo Dunaway and currently I work at the Writing Center as the coordinator. Um, I have a lot of practice with test prep and I hope that you will find this useful. This is really an overview of the kind of items you might find on the T's test. And if you want to look at things more specifically, I highly recommend that you make an appointment with the Writing Center or if you need math or science help at the Academic Support Center so that you can get some additional support to help you with your T's preparation. You should know going in that there's no real passing score for the T's test. Instead, each section is given a composite score and a score is given for content. They agree that reading and math are the most important sections, though reading and science seem to be weighed the most heavily. So as a reading person, you can see that reading will be important as you go into your medical career. Um, you should also know that, the, that on each test, when you take the test, if you need to take it more than once, that you always have to take all the sections of the test at the same time. And you can take the test two times within a calendar year to have it submitted with your application. The test changed a few years ago from version 5 to version 6. Um, one of the things that changed for the reading section is um, the time. It's 64 minutes for the reading section. It used to be 58. The number of questions also changed. They added five more questions. There are 53 reading questions. There are still six questions that they use to figure out new questions for next time, their validity, but um, you will never know which questions are counted and which are not. So for the reading section, the T's five study guides, if you can find those around somewhere, they are still useful for, for preparing for this version of the test. However, it wouldn't be as helpful if you were studying for science or math. There are three core skill areas that this test covers. The biggest area, which makes up 47% of the test, is key ideas and details. Those are things like, what's the main idea? What are the supporting details? Those are the kind of questions you would see in that section. The second section, which has 14 questions and makes up 30% of the test, is craft and structure. So questions about organization or word choice would be in this section. The third section is integration of knowledge and ideas. It is 23% um, of the test and it has 11, about 11 questions in it. In this section, you'll have um, where there are two selections and you're going to compare them or you're trying to gain um, information about how well an argument is presented. So let's look at the first section, which is about key ideas and details. It is, of course, the largest portion of the test. Some of the other kinds of question stems that you might want to be familiar with are those about topics, main ideas, and supporting details. Um, how to summarize how to make an inference, identifying information from graphic representations, um, info from memos or announcements, advertisements. These are just different kinds of information that, um, different kinds of formats that you can get information from. Following directions and events in the sequence would also fall under this section. Take a minute to read the um, passage on the left and answer the three questions on the right in your head. Um, these are the kind of question stems that you might see on the test that refer back to a writing. So take a minute to do that. On the next slide, I'll give you the right answers. So never fear. So how did you do? You can see on the right hand side that I have highlighted the correct answers for the questions for this selection. On the left hand side, I highlighted some of the ideas that led me to those correct answers. Let's talk about the kind of words that you need to know what they mean when you're taking the test. The first one is about finding the main idea. 
The main idea is the central idea that tells the reader what the selection will be about. It's the subject the author is talking about and the point they're trying to make about it. Um, be careful when you're taking, when you're looking for the main idea on this test, because you're not looking for a statement that includes information that's beyond what the passage states. The information might be true, but it's not what's on the text. So you want to make sure that you stick to what's on the selection that they give you. It's also not a summary of the selection. It would have too many details. And it's also not an analysis of the selection, where somebody gives you their opinion about what the article is about. So you can use some process of elimination to narrow down your choices. So look for answers that are too general or too specific that you can eliminate. You can also eliminate answer choices that are true but miss the point. Um, make sure that you're not including anything that isn't in the text or makes a false statement or an answer choice that doesn't fit the ending or the, or the final solution. So if it covers most of the passage but misses one of the major points, then that's not the main idea. Supporting details tell you about the evidence that the author uses to support his point. Answers are in the text, but they may be reworded so that they aren't exactly the same as what appears in the text. Usually when you look for a supporting detail, you're looking for something that's right there in the text that you can point to. But be careful because it may be reworded in these cases. Summarizing is another um, skill that they may ask you to identify when you are talking about summarizing. You list the topic of the selection, you discuss the main idea, identify what it is, and then the supporting details. And all of these things are combined in, into one statement, and that would be the summarizing of a paragraph or a selection. So you want to make sure that you're having all those points when you're asked to summarize. Main ideas are going to be more general. Summarizes, summarizing requires you to have more details and includes the supporting details. Inferences are hard, harder to do than you would think. It's not directly in the text. If you are making an inference, that's not something you can point to in the text. It's based on clues in the writing and background information that you have. So many times you'll hear me say things like, this is based in the text. Don't go beyond what's in the text. But for an inference, that's something you need to do. You need to make sure that you don't go too far beyond what's the text, what's in the text, and that you are basing your inferences on the clues that are in there. But you can see that these would be some ideas of inferences. You know what happened here. You know how this feels because you have the background information about what it feels to so, like to sunburn your feet, right? You can even tell me what kind of shoes this person was wearing, even though it isn't exactly written there. You know the emotion that the baby is feeling in the second picture. Um, so you know that they're not sad, that that's not crying, even though it isn't written there. You would know from the smile on their face, the twinkle in their eyes, things like that. In the final picture, you know that that's not the first day of school, right? It's probably more like the last day of school. So there are things that you know from your own knowledge and the clues that are in the text that'll help you make an inference. Another kind of question on the text would be following directions. In this type of question, you must very carefully look for the signal words that tell you what happens first. So you're looking for that first, second, next. Sometimes they put them out of order and they'll say, before you do this, do that. So make sure that you are looking for the signal words and putting the directions in the correct order.
Printed communications are just different kinds of writings that they may include in the text questions. So any kind of printed communication in a business world, such as memos, bulletins, reports, letters, descriptions, proposals, contracts, emails, these are all printed communication and can be used to draw information from. Um, one of the questions that really stumped me called the communication a memorandum. And it took me a while to realize that they were talking about memos because I had always heard the shortened, shortened version of the word memo and not memorandum. So being familiar with the types of different communications that are out there, most of them are very common and they're just pulling information from those things. Gaining information from graphs, charts, and maps can be very important. So take the time to study the graphic representation carefully and read the question carefully to see what's being asked of you. Um, sometimes they give you a table and they ask you to pull information from the table. I was very surprised to see math questions in my reading section in the form of graphic representations with charts. They would give you three different um, scenarios where you would pay a base price and then a price per unit and if you bought so many units which one was the best price so thinking through what they're asking you to do reading the question carefully is really important um, events in the sequence uh, these can be very difficult as they use words like counterclockwise and clockwise and alphabetical order and reverse alphabetical order. So getting yourself some practice with events in the sequence is also very important. The next section is craft and structure. It's the second largest section on the T's test and it has about 14 questions in it. In this section, you'll look at the difference between fact and opinion biases and stereotypes, different structures of text, connotative, denotative, and figurative meaning of words, author's purpose, author's point of view, and text features. Something that is harder to do than it would appear to be is to distinguish facts from opinions. Facts are statements that can be verified. They can be proven true or they can be proven false. Statements of fact are objective. They contain information, but do not tell what the writer thinks or believes about the topic. So a simple statement would be, my car payment is $450 per month. I could look that up. I could verify that that's true. So the questions would be, can the statement be proved true or demonstrated to be true? Can the statement be observed? And observations are facts. So if you're observing that some flowers are bigger than others, some flowers, some are bigger than others, that's observable and is a fact. And the statements can be verified by witnesses, manuscripts, or documents. These are ways that you prove things to be factual. Opinions are statements that express a writer's feelings, attitudes, or beliefs. They are neither true nor false. They are one person's view on a topic or an issue. You can agree with the opinion, but that doesn't make it a fact. So my car payments are too expensive. So they're taking a position on how they feel about their car payments. You could say, um, Brad Pitt is the most handsome man alive. And many people would agree with those statements, but that doesn't make them facts. Some other things to think about is if you're making predictions about things that will happen in the future, that's an opinion. And if you're evaluating people, places, or things, those are also opinions. Here are some other types of opinions that they tend to throw in on the test. Um, a hypothesis. I'm sure many of you in the medical field are familiar with science and making a hypothesis. So here it says some flowers are larger than others because they are in more fertile soil. 
So though I can observe that the first part of the sentence is true, some flowers are bigger than others, larger than others, I do not know the cause of that without further investigation. Unless there was a study attached to it, I can't prove that that's why some are different than others. They could be different types of flowers. Another type of opinion is an assumption. An assumption is an opinion that's a prediction of something that will happen in the future, and it can't be proven. So for example, if I said, if we exclude the voices of minorities from environmental policy making, we will continue to make the same mistakes as in the past. Though I believe that to be true, that is my opinion, and isn't a proven fact. Businesses that provide plastic straws to customers will cause pollution, that's a fact, but and destroy our oceans, that part is an opinion. That's something predictive in the future, and I don't know that that's true. Statements of value are another type of opinion. A value statement is a claim that is based on someone's beliefs. So for example, Colin Powell is an, ex is an excellent candidate for president. I may believe that, but that's my opinion. Education is important for everyone. I believe that, right? But that shows my values and that's my opinion. Um, so the rest of those are value statements. They show the, my value in something and they express the writer's opinion. So words that signal opinions are of course like those extreme words, always or never. And they also show like that um, bias or that slant. Toward. Let's look at some examples of factor opinion. Take a second to read the first couple sentences by the first arrow. Is that a fact or an opinion? So this one is a little tricky because I said that according to this magazine, they reported that Allergan faced a bumpy approval process. This part is an opinion. However, since I'm saying that this is what they reported, that is a fact. I could prove that. Read the second arrow point. For the second one, this is a fact. Even though I've used many of the extreme words, lowest, most, um, most reported reactions. I've attributed all these things that can be verified and um, or attributed to a source. Let's read the third bullet. This is an opinion because it asks you to look at a future event and I can't prove that Allergan will struggle to find an audience. Take a look at the last one. Most of this is a fact. However, superior, high quality, those words make the fourth choice an opinion as well. Bias and stereotypes um, are used in the T's test to um, convince you of a point of view or sway you towards a statement that is an opinion. A bias is a tendency, a trend, an inclination, a feeling, or an opinion that is preconceived and usually unreasoned. So that's why I have these pictures of sports fans there because we all know that our sports team is uh, something that we don't reason about. It's usually somewhere where you grew up and that's how you think about, you know, things you like. Um, so that's why I use that example. I can also tell you that I only, I have a particular bias for Heinz ketchup. I only use Heinz ketchup. So um, there's no reason why that is, but if it came down between buying Heinz ketchup and buying Hunt's ketchup, I would not buy ketchup if I had to buy Hunt's. Okay, so there's no reason for that. It is preconceived, and the words that I would use to describe Hunt's 
would show you my bias against it. Stereotypes are very similar, um, only it's about a group of things, usually a group of people. So I gave you some examples here. Um, white people have no rhythm. That's the Seinfeld clip that's there. Um, girls are not good at sports. These are stereotypes. So you're lumping everybody into one category. And that is a stereotype. Authors write usually for three reasons, right? We explain something to you that's expository. We um, persuade you of something. Um, or we narrate something to you, tell you a story. The T's adds a next, another category. They call it technical writing. They give you information to perform a task. So the only ones that are going to be technical is like a list or, or um, directions to do something. That is information to give you to perform a task. And that would be technical, that, the type of. There are also five common text structures that the T's test um, usually employs. One is description. This is pretty straightforward. It describes something. It has details about what it's describing. They can be found anywhere, different kinds of articles and different kinds of text, but the main key is that it describes something. Another common text structure is a problem solution where the author identifies a problem and then gives you a solution for it. So you need to look at transitional words here to decide if it's giving you a solution as to how to correct the problem. Another common one is a sequence. It gives you a sequential step sequential steps to do something or it's chronological events um, that are used. So again, you're looking at transitional words after, before, last, so that you can follow in a step in a sequential step process. The last two are cause and effect. So one thing causes another thing because is a transitional word that is used to show this very frequently. The fifth text structure is a compare and contrast where you're looking at two different items and you're either telling how they're similar, comparing, or how they're different, contrasting. Denotation versus connotation is something that um, is used to show tone or feeling or a bias in words. Denotation is strictly the meaning of the word. This would be what you would get from the definition. And connotation tells you the feeling behind a word. So think about the example of house versus home. Their definition is basically the same, but the feeling behind home is much different from what is behind house. So think about your home versus just your house. In the same way, immature versus youthful also has two different feelings behind the word. Figurative language isn't used too much on the T's test, um, but it is to show tone or to show a bias towards something, those feelings behind words. The three most common figurative devices are a metaphor, a simile, or personification. So I gave you three examples here, but it's not used too much, just in that trying to get a feel for the words. So all these things bring us to the author's tone, which is how the author views the subject. Tone is expressed through the word selection, and it starts out by either being objective or subjective. So when a tone is objective, that is just giving you the facts. And when it is subjective, it's giving you an opinion and it's leaning towards one side or the other. Now there are more words that describe tone than I could ever list here. So you should know that 
Um, you may see words on a test that you do not recognize and you have no idea what they mean. So your best way to approach those types of questions is to use process of elimination. Get down to the words that you're sure either might be it or are definitely not it and then give it your best guess. There are four examples on this page. Let's do those real quick. My apartment has two bedrooms and one bathroom. You can see that that is just the facts. That's a fact. So that is an objective statement. This apartment may not be great, but since it's where we lived when my children were born, it holds a special place in my heart. So that is not just the facts. So that is subjective. And I may call that tone something like nostalgic. Um, so that I can describe that feeling of having my where my kids were born. The third one, this dump needs some serious repair work done to it before anyone else would consider it livable. So you can see that's not objective. That's a subjective feeling. And I may describe that as angry. The fourth one, the landlord wants me to leave this place in the same condition that I found it in. I don't know if I can find that many cockroaches before I leave. You can see that that is also subjective. It has an opinion. I might call that um, sarcastic <laughs> to describe that one. Text features in a book are important to know. So if you had an actual book to look at, you could look over these text features, which are sometimes asked about in the T's test. The table of contents appears in the front of a book and it lists items as they appear throughout the book. Headings appear in the book and they give you an idea of what's in a section. A key or a legend, these terms are used interchangeably and they refer to um, like the parts of a map that would describe to you what the features are, the colors are on the map. A superscript and a footnote go together. A superscript is the very tiny numbers that you can see in the text. Then they refer to a footnote at the bottom of the page, which describes why that little number was put there. A glossary and an index occur on the back of the book. A glossary is going to give you alphabetical terms and definitions of words that appear in the book. An index is an alphabetical listing of items that are in the text that you have and where, what page they would appear on. The last three are internet kind of um, features. So a query is a question where you would type in your question. A search term um, would be what you would put in a search box and a search engine would be usually we just say Google nowadays, but there are different search engines that you can use as well. This is an example of an index and you can see that the main topics are listed alphabetically and underneath them are the subtopics of where they were and where they were talked about. So the page numbers follow them. So if I wanted to talk about Balanomorpha and the embryonic development of that, I would look on page 186. The final section of the T's test is the integration of knowledge section. It has 11 questions in it. The kind of questions you might see in this section would be primary versus secondary sources, using evidence to draw conclusions, comparing and contrasting multiple sources, evaluating an argument and its claims, and evaluating and integrating data from multiple sources and formats. So primary sources, think of a primary source as where information was created. This is the original creator. So something like a diary or a journal is a primary source. Artwork, physical objects created by a person, those are also primary sources. So think about that as somebody who created the source during a certain time period. Secondary sources are when you gather information and then you reshape it, interpret it, and then present it. So 
textbooks are often considered secondary sources because I have gathered information about a time period and then I have rewritten it. Um, magazines are usually secondary sources because I'm taking information somewhere from somewhere else and I am rewriting it here. Tertiary sources, just as a side note, contain both both a primary source and a secondary source. So if I'm including information uh, from a primary source and then adding information about it, that's called a tertiary source. Multiple sources are also used. So when you are reading uh, two articles together, you wanna look for what they have in common. What topics do they both mention? What's different about them? Um, look for themes that are similar or the author's point of view as you're reading and that'll help you answer the questions more effectively. Um, some things to look at when you're looking at evidence-based predictions or inferences and conclusions are predictions. That's when you predict what's going to happen based on the information. Foreshadowing is when there's information there that hints at what's going to happen next. Um, the key to these is that they're based on what is in the text. So you have to look to see what's in the text to make a prediction or to make or to see what's foreshadowed. Arguments and evaluating them is something else the T's test asks you to do. So in an argument, the author states a conclusion and supports it with evidence. The strength of your evidence strengthens your conclusion. Most arguments include assumptions, which are unstated facts or ideas necessary for the conclusion to make sense. And introducing new evidence would strengthen or weaken an argument. So the question might be um, something like, if this statement were true, would this strengthen or weaken the author's argument? And that is the end of the overview for what's on the T's test. I've listed some resources here that you can click on, some free test prep things that you can use to help you prepare for the T's. Um, Again, this is a broad overview of just the kind of terms and questions that might be on the test. If you would like to sit down with somebody and go through some of your personal needs in a reading or in English about reading or English, please feel free to call the Writing Center. We have many resources and we'd be happy to sit down with you. It's a great way to schedule your study time because you can sit down with somebody and just go over some questions and talk about them and have some idea of why the answer is what it is. So I hope that you found this useful um, and that we will see you in the Writing Center soon.